Hey everyone, and welcome to Startup Savants, a podcast brought to you by Truic. I'm Annika. And I'm Ethan. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. And if you're new, this podcast is about the stories behind startups, the founders who run them, and the problems they're solving. For our last episode of the season, we brought on Kyle York of York IE, an investment and growth firm. We talked with Kyle about what sets York IE apart from other investment firms and why they offer additional services for advising and growth. Yeah, and we also talked about the business superpower that Kyle has developed as a multiple time founder. So if you want to hear more about that, then I guess you're going to have to listen to this one all the way through. So I'm going to let you do that. Let's jump on into this episode with Kyle York of York IE. Hey, Kyle, welcome to the show. How's your morning going? Oh, great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, we haven't had a morning show in a while. It's been a minute. Uh, um, so you were chief revenue officer at DIN, um, then spent time at Oracle after the acquisition, and now you've founded this extensive resource for startup founders. Can you tell us about that trajectory? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I grew up in a family business and always knew I wanted to be entrepreneurial. And, you know, I think I happened to just get lucky and sort of find tech and software early in my career. And majoring, I went to Bentley University in Waltham, Massachusetts, just outside Boston, and I majored in marketing. Uh, so I sort of naturally ended up in sort of marketing uh, sales track early in my career in software. And so did that for a few years. Uh, a college classmate or high school classmate, I should say, uh, actually uh, was a co-founder of Dine and recruited me back to my hometown. I was living in California uh, for my first company and uh, decided to take a leap on myself and came back and became chief revenue officer of D- Dine. Everyone says Din, Dine. It's always like interchangeable almost. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I rose with that company. We were 15 engineers. We scaled it up to a 500 person company, a hundred million dollar ARR uh, and sold the or. Uh, in late 2016, early 2017. But in parallel to that, uh, given Dyn was an internet infrastructure company, a lot of tech founders, engineers would come to us with their new great idea in building the next great app or the next great cybersecurity company. And I was chief revenue officer, so I would work with all the fastest growth companies and they would ask me a lot for help on their business model and yeah. their scaling plans. And so, so really early on, I started to take on a few advisory gigs, some independent board roles. Um, I started to open up my wallet and invest, <laughs> you know, right out of my W-2 income, like right back into other startups. And by the time we left Oracle, uh, myself and my now co-founders had started to work together and we had made over 60 investments in B2B software businesses, uh, sat on multiple independent boards, w- was an advisory board member to a dozen other companies and started to dream up the idea and the formation of what York IE could be. Could this be, could this potentially be something that full time we could all do and scale as opposed to like the advisory investing being moonlighting and having a full time operator gig where you're always feeling like you're, you know, kind of cheating on the other. Uh, yeah. Could we do it in one package? And so that was really the manifestation of York IE and um, we've been off and running uh, since. Yeah. And so how it all came together. Um, so what does York IE do? Yeah, so really back to that manifestation first, uh, we, you know, when you are a a successful exited uh, executive of a company and you you make some money, you know, you always get asked, like, are you going to go do it again? Or are you going to go become a VC? It's like, it's literally like this binary uh, path. Right. What we tried to dream up, it was more of this vertically integrated model where we could build an operating company uh, that has resources, infrastructure, uh, capabilities, data. Um, we have a tech platform and advisory services for startups um, that can work with any startups, right? That's a 70 person company scaling super fast. Um, that is a recurring revenue, uh, B2B focused business model uh, that is our core operating company. So that's what York IE does. The data platforms, a market research and data automation platform, think of it like an operator version of like a pitch book or Crunchbase has a lot of um, templates like live chat advisor, you know, kind of get a lot of support in a more um, self-service sort of way. Mm -hmm. The advisory services are tech enabled services for Marcom, product development, business growth, go to market and revenue operations, all leveraging that tech stack, but 
you know, putting an advisory services manager and delivering those things more as, um, you know, custom scope of work type services for the startup ecosystem. We also have a capital pool. It's not a traditional venture fund, but it's a seed stage uh, investment pool that we call an evergreen syndicate. Uh, we make 15 to 20 B2B SaaS investments in early stage startups every single year. And high net worth individuals and family offices are what we call investment partners who give us a five-year capital commitment and get an annual allocation into those 15 to 20 deals per year. So they, in essence, get an index of early stage SaaS through us. And that's a capital pool of a shade under $20 million per year wow. that's getting invested into the startup ecosystem. So it's kind of cool. I mean, the way we go to market and probably how we met is we put a lot of content out into the world on how to build and scale a startup yeah. from newsletters to interviews like this, to our blog, uh, to eBooks, to different curriculum and templates and playbooks, put that out into the world. And we drive a lot of inbound traffic to york.ie, our website, mm -hmm. and all of our social channels and profiles. And the startup ecosystem comes inbound and says, oh, I wonder if these guys can help us. Some of those companies are you know, 50 million ARR businesses who just need some service support. Um, some of them are pre-revenue, you know, Genesis stage ideas who are looking for more of an incubation and everything in between. So we have, in essence, a way from low touch to governance, high touch, yeah. to be actively engaged with the startup ecosystem. Gotcha. So... Um for listeners that may be really familiar with like a quote unquote traditional VC, what makes y'all different from other investment firms? Yeah. So I think first and foremost, I, I would view us more as, you know, a company like a modern McKinsey, Gartner, BCG, mm -hmm. serious decisions type you know, management consulting meets services, meets that pitch book crunch base, you know, kind of CB insights, uh, G2 type business yeah. that has a capital pool. So almost thinking of it a little bit more like corporate venture in a way, right? Um, I think it's just a little bit hard to see us as corporate venture because we're still a startup scaling ourselves, right? We're not the size of McKinsey or Gartner uh, right. yet. Right? Um, <laughs> we'll we, get there. We, we will uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, so I think most of the time when venture capital firms or private equity firms have services, they're only for their investments, right? They're, um, and honestly, the only ones who have services that are in-house and on payroll are the ones that literally um, are massive, right? Like Warburg Pincus or Bain or, you know, Insight or OpenView. Like they have to be like billion dollar funds to be able to support the infrastructure to help support their startups, right? Our capabilities, our tech platform, our SaaS platform fuel, our advisory services capacity, um, those services and capabilities are available to anyone. Um, and then, you know, the cream of the crop ends up in our investment pipeline and they have to be early stage, B2B SaaS, recurring, uh, tech laggard industries. We have an entire thesis designed to invest in those types of companies. So that's, I think, the biggest difference is we're not, you know, just a VC fund that mm -hmm. has services or capacity or data platforms. We, we're a company that invests. Um, second thing, which is nuance, but if you're, if you understand the kind of traditional fund constructs and alternative investments, whether it's a, a real estate fund, a hedge fund, a venture fund, a private equity fund, they all operate under the same 30, 40 year old construct of the two and 20. They, they take a management fee two you know, two, three, four percent a year for the life of the fund. And then they make 20 or 25 or 30 percent carried interest on the gains of the fund. That's the economic model. Yeah. And then they pass through all the all the deal fees, the legal fees, the tax fees to their LPs. So it's a general partner, limited partner model. Ours is not that construct. It's an evergreen syndicate. It's deal by deal economics. There are no management fees. We think it aligns the incentives with the entrepreneur as the client because we're, they're not, we're not charging investors, you know, this annual fee and getting fat and happy off their, off their management fees. We're having to go earn it and build great companies and get them to wins in the win column. So it's also the construct and the economic model for the investors. It's very different than a traditional fund. Yeah. So essentially York IE touches the startup market or the or, or the industry the companies within the industry in just a ton of different ways it's not like you're just looking for that one touch point to to invest in the companies you're also doing all the other stuff as well um and as mentioned before you have had you know quite a quite a career 
um, whether that be in large companies or in entrepreneurship yourself, what do you consider to be your personal superpower in the entrepreneurship game? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm an incredible BD guy, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I can dot connect uh, things and work in a ridiculous flow uh, that most people are just incapable of, right? I think my business world and my sort of York IE, York IE is investment enterprise, mm -hmm. um, is is incredibly complicated. I mean, York IE as a as a business itself is like twelve legal entities um, that exist kind of beneath beneath the covers that we sort of tie together into this clear and concise. Um, discussion we're even having today. So I think it's that kind of matchmaking, BD, dot connecting, deal deal guy uh, at the end of the day that that differentiates me um, and that high throughput, high capacity, you know, like an engineering brain, single threaded, a finance brain, single threaded, a, a accounting brain, single threaded. I grew up in sales, you know, that's working lots of deals at any given time, pushing them along through process. Uh, and I've just sort of escalated that to a more strategic, bigger picture uh, level. I, I also do consider myself a pretty good evangelist too. I mean, I think um, the difference being in York IE, it's like the first thing in my career where I'm like so passionate about it too. It's like, I'm not just evangelizing. Dine did the domain name system, you know, before that I worked in ed tech software, you know, like these things are like cool, I guess, but like the, the passion I got was around the brand, the people, the opportunity, but like, was I like an internet infrastructure, like, you know, lover, or like it was like, eh, this is where I worked, right? <laughs> yeah. um, where now I think it's as authentic and genuine, like it's entrepreneurial, it's helping entrepreneurs build and scale their companies their way. Uh, it's bringing a little bit more pragmatism to the Silicon Valley growth at all costs, sort of vanity metrics game that the current macro market is crucifying. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's been a big, big differentiator to that kind of Yankee pragmatism here being from the Northeast. So, so this business development skill, I, I, I heard you mention sales a couple times, and I'm guessing that that's a, a major place where you kind of developed that skill. When you were in those sales positions, were these, were these business deals, business sales that you were making, did you have the ability to get creative in those deals in a sense that like, if you were a, um, I'm just going to use the the most basic term. If you were a shoe salesman, you know, yep. you can't get super creative. It's like shoes for dollars, basically. Yep. Um, where, did you have it's the ironic ability? ironic because I actually have a shoe company in my <laughs> universe called York Athletics. Try them out. Use coupon code York IE. You guys can have some. All uh, right. But, but yeah, no, it's a heck of a question. I think the um, – I was very, very fortunate – in my early twenties in my first company because sales, it was a, it was an ed tech platform, um, for software to run your schools. So like a good client of ours in Michigan was Cranbrook schools, uh, mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so, you know, we basically had the operating system, the CMS to build the front end websites, but then the back end to run the school grading admissions, uh, fundraising. And it was this end to end suite for private schools. Well, in some instances, you know, I'd be pitching as a as a young twenty something. Uh, Bill Gates is the chairman of the board of Lakeside School in Seattle and gave him forty million dollars. And the next instance, I'd be pitching a K to five Montessori school in you know Texas that you know a teacher was the tech decision maker, yeah. right? Um, so I learned really quickly how to sell like enterprise sales or sort of more transactional uh, sales in different capacities. Because it was a platform and it had a suite of tons of different capabilities and products and services, every deal was sort of bespoke and um, and con consultative and relationship based. And I think it was just an amazing fertile ground for me early on to be very creative with, you know, hearing the customer. What are they? What are their pain points? Where do they need help? How can our um, company come up with repeatable use cases and a consistent value prop for them uh, and their implementation of our capacity, right? So, so that's, I think, the fertile ground, the, the training point that made it more creative. When I went to Dine, it was a little bit more like shoe sales, right? I mean, we, we had a DNS product. There was competitors. Our product did this, this, and this. There was sure a roadmap, but it was much more of like an off-the-shelf, you know, multi-tenant recurring revenue SaaS business. The difference being, though, is because we were internet infrastructure, 
the use cases across, you know, a company that was maybe a mobile game versus a um, CMS platform versus an email marketing company uh, versus, uh, you know, the next social media juggernaut, the use cases of the technology were all very different. And the relationships of those companies weren't always um a customer uh, vendor, right? Many times, you know, our biggest company in the world, client at Dime, was AWS, Amazon Web Services. Yeah, and you know, wow. Amazon Web Services was also our biggest competitor in the world, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, the relationships were very complex. So you had to work out really unique, um, you know, sure, customer engagements, but also partnership, uh, white label partnership, uh, embedded partnerships, technical integrations uh, into the overall scope and package. So. I think every business sort of scales itself. The, the best SaaS businesses especially scale themselves on the repeatable, uh, the widget to, widgetization, the sell a lot of shoes mm-hmm. on repeat over and over and over and over again. I right. mean, the beauty of SaaS though is like you sell one shoe, they renew the same shoe next year, next year, next year versus straight widgets. But also being able to do enterprise or strategic sales or partnerships that are very creative and unique, um, obviously without getting too far out of your lanes that you like break your business model and do something that for one one off for a client that doesn't fit the technical capacity. Um, but yeah, no, I think those types of things were the good examples of how to you know, do creative business deals along the way. Cool. So let's talk about York IE for just a second. You mentioned uh, a few questions ago that York IE is a startup itself. It's um, you know it is a growing business. It's not just it's not just a, an investment firm out there. It's it's got you know a product. It's got services. It is a startup business. So how is York IE funded? Yours truly. Um, so uh, when I decided to build York IE, knowing the complexity of it and knowing that it was a lot of things in one, right? I mean, we could have set out and said, let's just go build a boutique, you know, PR firm, or let's go build a dev studio, or let's just build a seed fund, or let's build an analyst firm. Um, and we decided to kind of do a bunch of those things in one unsiloed, integrated package. Because of that, I think it, it, it also lended itself towards this is the type of thing that is going to need to be malleable and flexible and iterative uh, as we grow. Um, so we made a decision very early on that I was going to self-fund the business and we were going to bootstrap ourselves to a sustainable business model um, for the for the foreseeable, call it decade ahead future. So as much as we have investment partners who invest with us, and again, any of your listeners who are high net worth or family offices who have interest, happy to talk about our model and how it differentiates from traditional seed, yeah. no investors, outside investors are investors in Core York IE. That's just myself as an owner and you know, majority owner and also the team members that I give equity to. Yeah, there's, a, you know, I say this every time, I think there's just recurring themes that I don't like spending money. So <laughs> y'all that build it up by yourselves are amazing. Um, well, you know, and listen, at Dine, we ended up scaling 100, scaling to 100 million ARR. Yeah. We ended up raising 100 million of private equity. But- we actually scaled the business to 30 million ARR with no outside capital. It's the, it's the best part of the Dine story. It was like, like no one believes that today when right. I say we literally <laughs> scaled on customer revenue. Imagine such a thing, right? When we raised money, it was actually mostly secondary because founders were leaving and it wasn't coming to the core balance sheet. And even the last round we raised, which was 50 million, it was six months before we sold the Oracle, right? It wasn't like we ever used a lot of the money to scale. I think there was only like 5 million put into the company to get to 100 million of like primary. So I think it's just an important like foundation. If you look at my like family business upbringing and then you look at that approach, which is very non-Silicon Valley, yeah. and then you bring that forward to York IE, um, you know, honestly, the hardest part of scaling Dime, actually, the most annoying, uh, the most mental health traumatizing was my investors, right? Like, you know, at the end of the day, they made life much harder than I think it needed to be because of the pressures that come from board governance and, you know, them needing to serve their clients, which are their investors. And so we just wanted to have a whole different construct and model so we don't get caught in that trap. Yeah. So as far as your uh, experience previously with investors, did that influence how you've kind of formed these relationships with your own uh, your own startups and founders, like you've adopted them? Yeah, I would say uh, my experience, not only with investors, but 
also with analyst firms, with agencies, with consultants, with advisors. I just always felt like it was uh, a few different things happening. You have just misaligned incentives like everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. Like even even time horizons. Like if you're talking to like a you know consulting shop about helping you with marketing, well, or a legal law firm or something, they're all hourly based and they're all looking to get as much money out of you in the short term as possible, right? If you look at an investor, well, they're long term based, trying to figure out how do they turn your company worth fifty million into a company worth two hundred fifty million, right? Yeah. Like like so like you don't align any of these incentives, and then all these different. Um, service providers or investors or partners or vendors all end up in their different silos in their different functional counterparts inside a company. So I think it just becomes like when you start to scale and you look at cost Mm -hmm. um, and you look at like efficiency of capital, you know, it's spent all over the place, right? I mean, at scale at Dine, we were spending 30, 40 grand a month on analyst firms. We were spending 25 grand a month on PR and content shops. We were spending 30, 40 grand a month on independent consultants helping us enter new verticals or market segments, you know, like you start to add all this up and you're like, this is straight chaos. <laughs> so again, I think um, we're trying to help those traps be avoided based on the learnings. I mean, it didn't crater our company, but it has cratered lots of companies when their burn rates get so high because those alignments are, are misaligned. Those incentives are misaligned. Yeah, absolutely. And as far as the um, startups and founders that you choose to work with, can you identify like a trait or a couple traits that kind of binds them all together? Yeah, I think when it comes to the founders, you know, I I do think it's a lot of like philosophical alignment on like how to build a company, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times these days, you you know, if you read TechCrunch or Business Insider or read the Axios, you know, newsletter, you know, everything's about this company raised this much money at this valuation, right? Well, guess what? Like from day one, those companies tend to have a pitch deck that they're even in their seed round where the milestones are fundraise events that are going to come into the future. Mm -hmm. Um, I think our thesis is all around like, you know, founders who want to build a good and healthy and scalable business. Um, And, you know, yes, we're not against raising money um, or raising a lot of money if the market opportunity opens up for you, but not that being like the sort of default de facto strategy to build like a high burn, um, sort of un- underwhelming, unimpressive business, right? Like as a kid, if our family business didn't do well, like, you know, what, what, what's the, what, what happens when we don't eat, you know, like, yeah. you know, like that's like, like, right. Like, and I think it's just become, um, the culture has become, everyone's going for an outlier, like a Figma, mm-hmm. right. Or a GitHub. And it's like, well, those are outliers. So don't, that's not the playbook you should follow. You should follow the playbook of like good, healthy exits. And I know tons of founders who have sold their company for 20 million bucks or 50 million bucks or a hundred million bucks or 500 million bucks and are like set for life, multi-generations like, you know, and I think, I just think the whole game has shifted. So typically it's founders who are just much more like business model centric, um, are like pragmatic, are like, really thoughtful about the plans. Um, they're believable. Uh, they don't need to be blow the socks off. You know, they need to be solid. And again, if the market opportunity opens up, we'll support it and i um, sure they'd go for it. But it's a little different game. Yeah. So I spent a bunch of time reading over the website and we talked, we just talked about, you know, who the founders were that you're looking for. But I think, I think we can also move into the types of businesses that you're looking to invest in. And I know you mentioned earlier that it's, um, I think you mentioned uh, SaaS, B2B, um, tech, laggard spaces, uh, those types of things. Um, But you mentioned something on the website uh, that stuck out to me is that York IE invests in markets and people with a market in approach. Can you tell us what market in means? Yeah, it's great. Actually, that's, um, you know, I probably had two ways to answer your last question, Annika. You know, I think you can go for both. Yeah. Yeah. But the mark, I would have said market and approach to company building. I think the, uh, so it's a great follow up, Ethan. Like the general idea is that, you know, most, um, 
founders, uh, especially in software, or tech, or infrastructure, tend to be engineers, right? Like, like a lot of people, like, I, I don't know what I would do to begin if I wanted to go had some great product idea if I didn't have an engineering co-founder, right? So a lot of founder CEOs, um, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, a lot of these guys end up, they're, they're devs who hack something and then that becomes their big idea. That's the product I would approach to company building, right? It's like, I'm going to build something because I see, you know, an opportunity and I'm going to build and iterate on it and take it to customers into the market. We like the market up in approach to company building, which is more the, I'm going to analyze an industry. I'm going to have deep market uh, expertise, domain expertise. I'm going to look for the gaps in that industry and I'm going to decide not only what product to build, but also how to message position, price, build the go to market, all the other, you know, business building things attached to how to disrupt that market and that industry landscape. Um, that is a very, very different slant on the way companies typically get built. Uh, so everything about York IE from our data platform, which is a market research, you know, competitive intelligence, like look up a company, create watch lists, uh, track markets and industries, like understand their news, their blogs, their hiring plans, their funding strategies, like roll that all into this cohesive view all the way to all the services we offer, they're all anchored in that market research, understanding your market. Do you know competitors messaging, positioning, product suite, uh, pricing, packaging, uh, hiring plans? I mean, all these things dictate sort of more of a market in view to how to build a company versus that product out view. So, you know, it's a good way to define it, right? Is to think about like the inverse of it would be product out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's a great way for people to kind of get their heads around what market in approach to company building means. So these founders and companies that are coming to you with this product out view, where are they, where are they getting this? Is this something that's, it, that's taught in some classrooms and other classrooms is, is not taught or is this like, um, just uh, they're doing what they think they need to be doing because they're they're reading some blog or like where are they learning this the wrong way? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just the way it's always been done. And I think a lot of companies, if you look at it, it's like somebody works somewhere, <laughs> is working on something, you know, right? Like coding something in a product team and a lot of times spin out and say, you know what, I'm going to go do my own startup. And it's based on, what they've been functionally doing, right? Um, even a lot of times when someone, you know, a lot of our, our our founders are like either the founding engineer who needs a lot of business and go to market support. I think we're a wonderful fit for that if you're looking for help. Um, also, it tends to be people from markets or industries, but aren't SaaS or product people, right? So we invest in a lot of vertical SaaS. I mean, back to my ed tech roots, right? That was somebody who knew education and K-12 schools incredibly well and basically was like, oh, I think there's an opportunity to go disrupt that space with tech and automation and software, right? Like that's what we're seeing a lot. I mean, we have companies in vertical SaaS that are ed tech. We have ocean tech. We have uh, health care tech, you know, we have like all these different sort of vertical um, innovations that are based on, you know, market or industry expertise coming in to say, what can I build for a product? So I, I think it's honestly just more of the way it's kind of always been done. I do think modern tech stacks and modern tooling and offshore development resources and a lot of things are sort of shifting this paradigm where business people, sales, marketing people, finance people can start companies now and lean on, you know, modern tech stacks and AWS and cloud platforms that historically were like, Mind blowing for people, right? Like, what do you mean we're gonna have we're gonna have developers in Ukraine or Lithuania or India or yeah. you know South America? Like that, that to me, fifteen years ago was as scary as it gets. Right. Um, today, there's a lot of ways you can kind of get to get to market better. That's so I think it's why the timing on the market in is also really relevant today too. Cool. Um, quick sidebar: What is vertical SaaS? Vertical SaaS is so. Um, so if you think of SaaS, I mean, SaaS to me is a business model, which is recurring revenue mm -hmm. software, right? Um, SaaS can go up and down the stack to, you know, they sometimes call it IaaS, like infrastructure. It can go to platform, PaaS as a service platform. It's like more data layer, API type companies. Okay. And then you get to SaaS. Well, some SaaS like... Um, HubSpot or Salesforce is horizontal SaaS, meaning they built a, a, a ubiquitous platform that can be used by any vertical industry, right? Um, that does specializes in something specific. 
Vertical SaaS is more when the technology application and capability is purpose built for that exact industry, right? So that's vertical SaaS would be like, is it a for manufacturing? Is it for education? Is it for um, financial institutions or banks? Like the so like fintech is a vertical SaaS play, yeah. right? Um, so that's that's the way you should kind of think about what a vertical. And honestly, those. Many times it's the most boring industries <laughs> that have been been so tech laggard and adopting automation yep. and, and data and technology that are the best ones to invest. What ends up happening in vertical SaaS often, though, is their um, total addressable market. How big can this company get? Mm-hmm. Sometimes can be as as big as the market they're disrupting. So if you're doing like organic farming tech or something, well, how many organic farms are there? Like at what ARR per customer can you get? There's your TAM, right? Like so, I think. I think that's sometimes the knock on it um, is that how can it get as big as Salesforce or Workday or, you know, right? Like, so um, that's where the, the kind of, but I think for us, it's like, well, those are, that's fine. You don't have to be a $10 billion company or go public, like right. build a good, healthy company that disrupts an industry and uh, becomes the household name. Uh, that's the beauty of vertical SaaS. You can literally own a space uh, pretty quickly. Yeah. That's an excellent answer. It's not, it's not what I, call, I was envisioning. I call it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also, I also call it like from a sales perspective, going back to my roots, right? Like it's point and shoot, right? Like if you decide I'm going to build a technology platform for a specific industry. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, when I sold K-12 private schools, back in the 2000, you know, 2005, 2008 period when I was really going hard at this, there was only 4,000 K-12 private schools in the country. Yeah. So I knew exactly the 4,000 schools to call. Right. And then it was just about what's my ideal customer profile. Like, like all right, I like, I like boarding schools. I like schools with big endowments. I like schools that have enrollment over this many people. I like when I can go after the following titles as mm-hmm. the persona to sell. Right. It becomes like really, really easy to make replicable and hire a sales team and BDRs and market to them. Um, when you're horizontal, what ends up happening is so many times the go-to-market gets built where they still pick two or three core verticals to go after first, even though it could sell every vertical under the sun. Dyn was a good example. The reason I left my first company with the Dyn is I was like, so you're telling me I can sell anybody with a website? Anyone? <laughs> And they're like, yeah, I'm like, thank God, because I've been say, giving the same sales pitch to tech to people at schools forever. And I keep, I'm going crazy. Right. Um, so I think that's the that's the biggest delta. Like you get the vertical SaaS and it's straight up point and shoe. Um, but again, if that company, you can do the math. If there's 4000 schools, if you have 100 percent market share, um, no matter how big per year the customer contracts are, it's not a giant company. Right. It's a healthy it can be successful company. Yeah. But it's not huge, right? So that that company ended up selling to Blackbaud, which was a public um, software company um, that did fundraising software. And so that company's tech has now moved into like, you know, faith and public schools. And, you know, now the TAM is bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. So in doing research, we we came across uh, vanity metrics a couple of times. Um, Can you tell us what 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 is a vanity metric and why should they be avoided? So back to the outlier comments earlier or the TechCrunch headlines, yeah. right? Like, you know, you tend to hear about these companies with 100K ARR raising, a you know, $50 million and a $300 million valuation. And to me, everything I just said there about the ARR is a vanity metric, right? Um Hey, these guys got to 1 million users, but they have zero revenue, yeah. right? Um, these can be vanity metrics, right? So vanity metrics are just like these sort of like non-fundamental business metrics that get used to size up or, um, or, or celebrity, celebrity ties, if that's a word, yeah. <laughs> um, like startup founders and startups. And, and this is ends up being the doom of the, you know, I, you know, I could name names, but, you know, of the companies that sort of get big, raise tons of money and then plateau and die. Right. Um, so it's sort of the avoidance of like the ego and the celebrity around the startup landscape and what it means to build a good, healthy company and focus more on the fundamentals. Yeah. Yeah. It's like salary bragging. But <laughs> you said, Figma. yeah, I mean, it's, you see it. Yeah. I mean, honestly, you can see it in like, um, 
you could just like like all, all these things if you like just like look at your town or in yeah. your high school you know it's like what's the stuff that people thought was cool or think is cool or right. you know how do people operate in your community well you know the people that are like you know genuine and authentic and good just good people and you know the people who you know uh operate you know snobbishly or you right. know it's it's kind of like the same sort of you know thing yeah well in in talking about figma they just for anyone that's not aware, Figma was just bought by Adobe for twenty billion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, a nice little strategic uh, investment yeah. for Adobe. Largest private company um, tech exit in history. Um, company also <laughs> raised like half a billion dollars of outside capital. I mean, when you looked at, um, you know, venture firms were making two billion dollars in in these deals, right? Like, I mean, I think, so it's like, like, yeah, I mean, of course the founders did well and the team did well. I don't want to talk about it at all, but like, I mean, it was a financially engineered, like, you know, business that mm-hmm. got massive and it's amazing story, but yeah. like, that's an outlier. If you're building Correct. a company today and you're like, I'm going to go try to build Figma, it's like, <laughs> all right, cool. Like, I, you know, like, good luck. <laughs> good luck right. <laughs> um, and it's, and it's, again, there's a lot of luck and a lot of financial engineering that goes into that. Um, but you know, again, for every for every, I remember when I remember when we sold Dime, we sold Dime for six hundred million dollars. Um, months later, a company in in Massachusetts, in New England, um, where we were based in Southern New Hampshire, where York IE is, but an hour north of Boston, a, a, a peer company sold for six hundred twenty five million. Like mm-hmm. you know, like sold for literally, and people were like, "Ah, oh, you must be mad. You don't have the biggest deal in New England this quarter or whatever." <laughs> um, and I was like, "Hey guys, their last private funding." was at a $1.2 billion valuation. So for those who don't know, like, you know, when you raise money, um, outside investors get a better type of share mm-hmm. than, a, than a founder or an or a employee, you know, whether you're an individual contributor or even an executive, it's common stock versus preferred stock. Um, there's all these different terms, legal terms that are in these deals around like dividends and interest and um, preference stacks and liquidity um, multiples and different things that people just don't get, right? So when you waterfall out these companies, the what I mean by waterfall is like who gets money, who gets, where's the 20 million go, fig, or 20 billion go of Figma? Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's the vanity metrics, the top line number, but you don't really know the rest of the details. Right. So if that company literally raised at a valuation double, anyone who got stock options after, as a part of that raise, actually their stock options are worth way less than they had to exercise them for. Right. right? So these are just the things. Again, I, I, that was still a good, a good ex- exit, win in the win column. Yeah. All makes sense. But like, they're not apples to apples in any deal. So that's why, again, it's build good foundational businesses. Right. Be pragmatic, be thoughtful, don't chase vanity metrics. Like, and, and don't like, you know, measure yourself on what you want to build, not on what everyone else is doing, because you're going to be your own unique um, snowflake. Yeah. Right. Define success for yourself. Don't let someone else define it for <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, that's honestly, like, career-wise, like, like again, all this stuff can be attributed to, like, personal life or personal self. Like, you know, the way I build my companies is the same way I build my career. Like, set a long-term vision. Um, know what your North Star is and where you want to go long-term. Mm-hmm. You know, be super loyal along the way to, the you know, your mentors and your mentees and the people around you and the team that you need to build to get there. And then work your way back, like, and make sure that every decision, every career move you make um, fits into that long-term narrative and that long-term vision for yourself and that you're kind of making yourselves get there along the way. And for everyone that North Star, that vision is going to be entirely different um, and how that impacts their family and, you know, their lifestyle and all those types of things. But I think the same holds true for companies. Um Again, back to York IE, I feel like I've been able to merge that, right? That's the beauty of it. It's like I now feel like for the first time ever, I can go wake up every single day to build this really differentiated, disruptive model that also plays into my long-term vision, which is like make a big impact on, you know, my space, my community, my friends, my peers, my my family, right? Like all those types of things. And it's 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 a good foundation for that. All right. Let's talk about York IE's advisory services. So You focus on four different areas, product development and strategy, marketing and communications, go-to-market and rev ops, and business growth strategy. Um, Do you see any one of these as being even one or two percent 
more important than the other three? No, I think the um, reality is, though, we're iterating on what we offer, right? I think the we are listening to the startup ecosystem. We are listening to the founders who are in our communities. Uh, we are listening to the founders that are captively engaged with us in an advisory contract or in an investment. And we're continuing to iterate and evolve on what we are going to build first class native in New York IE versus partner with others to help us support. I think these capabilities are what we are uniquely capable of weaving together because SaaS is so interconnected between sort of business growth, capital strategy, business model, all the way back to R&D, how you build cost effectively, how you iterate and evolve your roadmaps, all the way through to what's the go-to-market to support that, what's the pricing and packaging to fit that, what's the go-to-market to build that, and then how do you evangelize that from a Marcom perspective. Right. So I think they're they're really actually much more integrated than you'd think. I mean, even in the Marcom module, well, people need website development. Well, I guess what? That's our product development team. In RevOps, it's like we want to implement Salesforce or HubSpot and integrate these different sales enablement tools. Well, we need developers to do that. Well, guess what? That's the product strategy. So as much as we've tried to like productize them and widgetize them and modular them, there's a lot of crossover and a lot of our engagements where we're leveraging others. The first one we launched was Marcom when we launched York IE. So we launched York IE in 20, late 2019. We launched initially just with the investments business because we just took our angel deal flow and put it into the investments business. In the summer of 2020 is when we launched services and we launched predominantly with Marcom. Biggest reason for that is I think it's the thing like most engineering founders just like save for later, right? Um, and in this day and age, if your content and, 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 um, mind share is key and king in the market, like if people don't know who you are and you don't have a credible brand, then you're not going to be able to win. Right. So we think people, companies need to be marketing themselves. I hate when I see a stealth mode startup. It's like yeah. the dumbest thing ever. Right. <laughs> it's like, no, you need to be evangelizing from day zero. Right. Um, so that's why we originally launched with Marcom. Right. Um, secondarily, um, go to market the strategy, what sales motion, we're, we're sales model. But a lot of times that comes when you're, you've got a few million ARR and you now are clueless on how to scale. I think that's an absolute sweet spot for us from a services perspective. It's the companies that actually have product market fit and are now like, crap, how do we scale from one to two to five to 10 to 20? Like, oh my God. Like, yeah. I mean, I actually joined Dine and had a couple million ARR and I took it to a hundred, right? Like I, if you actually look at what I love to do more, it's not 100% aligned with the stage we invest. We just invest really early and, you know, have to try to get these companies there. Um, so I don't know if I'd, I'd, um, I, you know, the most recent one that's like, you know, hitting the cover off the ball is the product development strategy. I mean, literally, um, we, acquired our outsourced Indian dev shop and we now have York IE Limited India, which is like, you know, pinch me weird um, <laughs> for me. And like my parents are like, what are all these Indian people on your website? You know, you, you have to go there? Like, like I'm like, no, we have a real company there, right? And so that's, when we acquired the contract dev shop, it was seven engineers. It's now 35 engineers. Wow. And I just asked them their hiring plan for next year. It's 200. Sweet. So like, I'm like, it's just insane, right? Like, um, so, you know, I think that's going to be a big part of it. But the beauty is the interchangeable nature of them. We're super malleable and flexible on the contracts. Like, you know, oh, we want to scale back R&D. We want to put a little bit more towards Marcom. Or, hey, we really need capital strategy, business growth strategy help. You know, can we lean in there? And we can be very malleable, which, again, if you think about the industry, those would be multiple different providers across multiple different teams in silos, all racing to how do they get as much cash out of you as possible per month. And our model is just very different. We won't just work for retainer. We will do some project work if it makes sense, deep dive analysis stuff. And we'll also work for stock or options or warrants or, you know, other vehicles if, if people want to keep costs down. Um, it's typically a balance, but, you know, we're, we're all about trying to make it work based on where the startup is in their life cycle. All right. So besides hiring 165 new engineers <laughs> in the next year, what is what's next? What's on what's on the plate for York IE here in the coming years? Yeah. So, you know, I kind of feel like this is sort of the first year I felt like the foundation's really strong. You know, like, um, you know, when you're building a, a startup and, and think of us in like the mid, you know, five, six million ARR kind of landscape. Um 
you know, when you get to this stage, like you need to make sure your systems, your processes, your people management, your your like corporate hierarchy and governance and all these things are like in place. Um, and I feel like that's like foundationally strong. And that's kind of been like the focus to get here. Um, I think we're now in like expansion scale mode, which means how do you make this like repeatable and scalable in a cost effective way? You know, if you look at our even our website, we're very top heavy. You know, we have a lot of very expensive leadership and, you know, we need to be able to build farm systems and hire young talent and train them and onboard them and be able to deliver the ROI and the value of this model. So a big focus for us is just going to be scaling. I think. Scaling clearly is scaling of the operating company. Like, I don't know, when are we super legit? And when someone can say, we're going to use you over BCG or ICR or Gartner or whatever, like you need to be of some like scale and like substance and credibility on the operating business. Is that people? Is that revenue? Is that, um, I don't know, geography? I, what, how do you measure scale? I'm still trying to chase that down. Same thing on the investments business. Like how big does that capital pool need to be where like, you know, the big tier one VCs go, wow, those guys are disruptive, right? They're, they're messing with us. They're, they're beating us to deals and they're coming in and leading all their deals. And holy cow, that model's working. Right now we're a shade under 20 million a year. I think it's got to get to 50, 60 million a year. And then at that point in time, it's like, holy cow, because <laughs> 50 to 60 million a year in a fund construct is a half a billion dollar plus fund, right? So I think that's the types of stuff that we're really focused on, Ethan, is like scale on this strong foundation. Um, that's really, really hard. Um, but I think we've got the team uh, to execute against it and make it happen. Yeah, just keeping the ball rolling. Okay. Um, what is your number one piece of advice for early stage entrepreneurs? Who? Um, Number one piece of advice is it's uh, not as fun as uh, you probably thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, I think, again, back to the vanity, there's a lot of like shine. And now there's movies, you know, on Netflix about, you know, these great startup founders. And I, I think it's a lot harder um, than, than people think it is, mm -hmm. regardless if you're running like a small business or a mom and pop store on, El on Main Street somewhere, right? Like, like it's really, really, really difficult to build a business and it's um, not always not always super fun. So I think you got to keep that perspective and you got to play the long game as we discussed earlier. Um, and, you know, uh, realize it's a roller coaster and there's no straight line to success on any level. The only other thing I'd marry that with is success is relative. It's back to the early her point of like setting your long game vision. Mm -hmm. Like like success to me is different than success to you and your firm yep. or success to the the restaurant owner or like like not everyone wants to franchise their restaurant, right? Like yeah. you know, um and I and I think that's fine. Like you have to define what you're trying to build and what success is to you and not care what anyone else thinks about that. Right. Um, so I think that's the other thing. Success is relative. Remember that, um, you know, try to funnel on the way, you know, you know just win, you know, yeah. um, but winning is also incredibly relevant. Awesome. Excellent advice. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. We just have one more question for you. Where can people connect with you online and how can our listeners support York IE? Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much for having me, both of you. Uh, you can find us at our website. It's york.ie. Uh, that is an Ireland top-level domain, playing heritage to our uh, DNS domain name system roots uh, back in the day. Uh, we're also at York Growth across all social channels. So find us on Twitter, Instagram. I think they're even TikToking a little bit. We've got a YouTube channel. We've got a bunch going on. Subscribe to our newsletter, york.ie slash newsletter. It's the most inspirational uh, weekly thing I get, honestly, every Thursday morning written by our CMO, Adam Coughlin. It's, he tells these like ridiculous stories and somehow compares them to business uh, every week. Uh, and also just find me. I'm KYORK20. I'm Kyle York on LinkedIn. You can find me. Um, I'd love to connect. And how you can help us is, you know, send us deal flow. Send us high net worth individuals who want to invest. Send us to your VC friends who want to co-invest with us. Uh, send us your startup. Come to us with your startup. If you need services, support, if you want our data platform or want to integrate, or you're looking for investment, um, you know, come right in the front door. We're, uh, we're wide open. Yeah. Can't yep. confirm. Y'all can expect my $20 in the mail. <laughs> yeah, I, I signed up for Fuel uh, 
a couple days ago, and uh, with that, I got uh, I got put into the newsletter. I'm not a huge fan of newsletters, but I tell you what, I got the first one, and I'm not gonna unsubscribe, which is a pretty big thing. Yeah, we thing. do it just once a week, Thursday morning. We don't abuse. Uh, you know, we came from internet infrastructure where we did like email sending. We know not to spam and send too much crap, right? Yeah. It's every Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern. It's very, very short, concise, and sweet. I think also like just from a free perspective, like our content is free. You can sign up for Fuel for free. Uh, we're not going to beat you over the head to pay us. You know, there is very good capability in the free version uh, to track yourselves, to track your market, to create watch lists, to do a lot of good things. And over time, you know, all I ask for people is let's grow together, right? I think this ecosystem needs more rising tides raising all ships and, and less like sort of like walled garden uh, type vendors and, and investors. And that's that's what we're trying to build. Yeah. Darn right. All right, cool. Thank you so much. We're going to put all those links in the show notes. Uh, we're going to put everything else you heard today in the show notes. But that is going to be it for today's episode of the Startup Savants podcast. Thanks for hanging out. <laughs>